The simile of the snake came about from my experiences as a young monk in northeast Thailand, in the jungles of northeast Thailand. I went back there recently, just a few days ago. But those jungles have changed a lot. In particular, where there was once many, many snakes, there's only a few left now. So I tell the monks, oh, you've got it too easy these days. In the good old days, there were all these snakes around. And I, I remember telling the story a few weeks ago, a week or two ago, when I've even peed on a snake. It was, just, it was a very dangerous thing to do. I wouldn't have recommend it to anybody. <laughs> And I'm meditating all night and getting up in the morning, he used to go to urinate in the bushes. And that one morning, it was at dawn, and you know, the light wasn't all that clear anyway, and I was a bit sleepy. And there was, you know, there's a, a stick, a branch of a tree in front, which I urinated on, and the branch started to wiggle. And I realized it was the branch, after all, it was a snake. And I moved away very quickly. <laughs> As part of my anatomy was exposed. But fortunately, so sort of, I apologized to the snake very quickly. So the snake sort of you know, stood away and sort of uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't take its revenge. There were so many snakes in those days. But in particular, these monasteries were very, very poor in those early days. And I remember clearly, we used to have all these meetings in the morning and the evening. And after the evening meeting, you had to walk through the jungle on these very 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 narrow paths from the, the hall to your hut where you slept. You know, maybe it was you know, quite a few hundred meters sometimes from the hall to your hut, sometimes a hundred, two hundred meters. And obviously you try to use flashlights, but it was so poor that many times we had the flashlights but no batteries. I remember actually going to see my teacher, Ajahn Chah, run out of flashlight batteries. Can I have some batteries? He said, I'm sorry, you can't, we've got none. There's none here. So I had to walk back from the hall to the place where I was sleeping without a flashlight. And in those jungles, even the starlight, it doesn't, there's too many trees, so you can't actually get any light coming into the jungle. It's really, really dark. And you knew there were snakes about, hundreds of them. And as I was first told when I went to Thailand, they told me there were hundred species of snake in Thailand. Ninety-nine are venomous, and the other one strangles you to death. <laughs> in other words, they're all dangerous. Thank you very much. So I had to walk back, knowing there were snakes around, and knowing those snakes were very dangerous. And the nearest hospital was a long way away, there was no phone. If you got bitten, you were in big trouble. So I used the simile of the snake, because I knew they were a danger, because I knew there were many of them around, and they were lying on the path. It meant that I was always on the lookout for them. I wasn't sort of mindless. There was a danger there, I had to get from the hall to my hut, I was looking out for them. My mindfulness was very strong, and they were focused on the danger which lay on the path. Because I knew there was a danger, and I was focused on that danger, and I was alert, awake, mindful of it, I never got bitten. Sometimes you see a snake there, you'd either jump off over it, or you sort of go around it if you could, or you take another path. Because I was on the lookout, and I knew it was a danger, I always managed to avoid it. It's called my simile of the snake. If an obsession, an addiction is a danger to you, whether it's alcohol or anger, or depression, or whatever, if you identify that as a danger, and you know it's on the path, in front of you in your life. Know it's a danger and be on the lookout for it. If you're on the lookout for it, you're aware it's out there and you're mindful, you're careful, you're alert, you find you can always step over these things. You can go another path, you can jump over them and they never catch you. Say so if it's alcohol, you can see it coming. You know alcohol, if you take that one glass, you have to take the second, and the third, and the fourth. 
and some person said that if you just take one glass of alcohol, that's okay, it doesn't really matter, does it? That's what people ask me over here. One glass of alcohol is okay, isn't it? And somebody compared it to like a fire. Big fires or small fires, they all burn. So even if you hold a match to your finger, it still burns and hurts. Even a small glass of alcohol takes away your mindfulness, your alertness. You're not as sharp as you were before. And because you're not as sharp as you were before, you can take that second glass of alcohol. But these are dangers. You see it as a danger. If you see it as a danger, you can actually see it happening. You want to look out for it. Look, this is a danger to me. I want to overcome this. If I see the the uh, the craving coming up, I'm moving towards this, I'm going to take evasive action quickly. And the mindfulness gives you the other opportunities. Same like anger. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's rotten to, you know, when you're angry at your loved ones. You know, you've got to live with them. You're stuck with them. And if you get angry at your mum or your dad or angry at your children, angry at your husband and wife, you know, we all feel terrible, at, terrible about it afterwards. Like, why did I do that? Why do I have to keep on relating to my loved ones like this? Why can't I be at peace with the people in my house? And you realize that that you know, creates so much suffering in your life. And so you start seeing when anger is about to come up, or these bad ways of speaking start to arise. You see the whole process coming, and something comes out saying, this is a snake, this is a danger, I don't want to be like this, I don't want my family to be like this. If I'm bickering with my husband, bickering with my wife, what are my kids going to do? They're just going to see that as a normal way of living life, and they're going to bicker and, and moan about their partners when they get married. And we just have this terrible, terrible way of living our lives. We don't bicker at our monastery and start you know, talking rotten things about each other and putting each other down at my monastery. When we speak, we speak kind words. We train ourselves to speak kind words. We train ourselves with this snake simile. If that is your nature and you start to see this coming up, you recognize it as a snake, you make sure you never step on that. You jump over it, take evasive action, do another thing, do another way. So one of the ways of escaping from you know, addictive behavior is remove yourself. Go away from the bottle. Go away from the cigarettes. Don't have them in your room. Move yourself away from the irritation. Instead of shouting at your wife, just you know, go to your room. But even better, come to the Buddhist center. Come to the temple. Actually, one thing which I always remember, this man came to our monastery in Thailand many years ago when I was there, and he just came up to me and, and asked, can I stay at the monastery for a few days? We had lots of accommodation at uh, our monastery in Thailand those days. He said, yeah, sure, you can come. Have you come to learn some Buddhism? He said, no. Have you come to learn some meditation? He said, no. So said, what have you come here for? He said, because I've had an argument with my wife. <laughs> What a wonderful thing to do, instead of sort of going down the pub, instead of going out with his mates, instead of going out to kill himself or something, he came to the monastery. He said, OK, you can come and stay for a few days. He was no problem at all. But after three or four days, he came up to me and said, can I go back home now? He wanted to take leave. I said, where do you want to go? He said, Cause I, you know, I miss my wife and I sort of feel cool now, I feel calm. I want to make up. What a very skillful way of doing things. And when people actually are angry and upset, instead of actually taking out on some other people, they actually go to a calm place, remove themselves from the trigger of their ill will to a calm place, to a peaceful place, to cool down, to take evasive action. So if you've got friends who get you into bad trouble, if you are in with a bad lot, and this is not a bad lot here. When you come to the temple, don't think... If people say you come to a bad lot, this is a good lot in this temple. So you come to a good place, it gives you good energy, you feel good about yourselves, and you're removing yourself from the problem. That's one of the things to do. Remove yourself from those things which trigger your addic addictions, your obsessions, and those bad ways of, of doing things. And then, once you've removed yourself, you find it's a great way of overcoming those things. Once you've removed yourself from the problem, then actually you can contemplate it much better. There's an old saying in, in Chinese uh, culture, say, to love the tiger, but at a distance. To love the tiger, but at a distance. 
So it means what that means is you, know, you can't go loving a tiger by patting him on the head or tickling him under the chin. They're going to bite your hand off. But what, you, what you can do is when you're away from this, the, 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 the danger, then you can contemplate it, then you can love it, you can change your attitude towards it. Sometimes it's very difficult. When there's somebody who's always, again, pushing our buttons, making us angry, making us upset, giving us a difficult time, it's so hard, actually, to, to understand what's going on when you're too close to it. Removing yourself from the problem gives you more options. You can see things in a different way. You can love the tiger at a distance. When they're close to them, all you have is fear. You have these obsessive reactions. In Buddhism, I usually use the simile of the hand to understand this. A hand, our problem, our addiction, the stimulus which creates these negative responses is like a hand which we're holding too close to ourselves. Like my hand now, you can all see, it's so close to me, I can't see any of you. I can't see any light, any goodness. All I can see is my hand. The reason is it's too close to my eyes. Just for the tape here, I'm just actually holding it right so, no, above my nose, covering my eyes. I can't see anybody. It's not the hand's problem. The problem is it's in the wrong place. I should put it out to where it should be, at the end of my arm. Then I can see my hand, but I can also see all of you as well. I've got mindfulness, a bigger picture. So often with obsessions, we have a stimulus. Say, you know, somebody, maybe your, your, your wife has left you, or maybe your father has died, or your child's you know, got into big trouble. And that's all one sees in one's life, just this big problem. And we react in an inappropriate way. If it's like somebody who's died, we act in grief as if it's the only person who counts in this world. They've died. The only people who die is the one you love. You can't see the bigger picture. You can't see anything else in life except this huge problem which you're holding right in front of you. With a grief, you take that problem, you put it out here. Yeah, they died, but what else is going on in the world? What else happens in life? Who else have you got who love you, who you care for, who care for you as well? Your other responsibilities. You put the problem where it belongs. You remove yourself from the problem. It's loving the tiger out of the distance, seeing the hand but at the end of the arm rather than holding it right in front of you. So you lost your job. So you've got cancer. There's more to it. If you hold the cancer right up to your hand, it's the biggest thing in the whole world. You can't see anything else. And you're in big trouble. You put it out here, you've got cancer, but it's only in part of your body. The rest of your body's healthy. Well, it's, you know, it's only part of the life, it won't last forever. As other people do this and get cancer, and they get better again afterwards. Some die, but if you die again, so what? You get reborn again, you get another body next time. Maybe a better one next time, who knows? Maybe this old one is getting old now anyway, getting ugly when you get old. Maybe it's time for, for a change of model. <laughs> when you hold it out in the hand over here, you know, what, what is death? It's only a part of life, it's no big thing. You know, when you get disappointed because things go wrong, so what? There's other things that have gone right in your life. Somebody dies, somebody gets born. It's happening all the time. So when you put it out here, you get distance from the problem. When you get distance from the problem, you find you can react in all sorts of different ways. You're not always reacting in the same way. You've got mindfulness, you've got more options because you're seeing the bigger picture of things. So that's why that person, if they were stayed with their wife, when, they, when this man who went to our monastery years ago, if they stayed with their wife all the time, they'd be just too close to the problem. And they'd be reacting the same way again and again and again. So they just put themselves a little distance apart, just for you know, a few minutes, a few hours or whatever, and see the big picture. And when they see the big picture, they've got more ways of responding, rather than always responding in the obsessive, reactive ways, which we call addictions. Remove yourself gives you more wisdom and gives you more ways of dealing with things. Also, when I say love the tiger at a distance, it's also this idea of love and kindness is also crucial to overcoming addictions. Because a lot of addictions and obsessions are like a self hurt. When we take alcohol, we know it's hurting us, we keep on doing it. Why? You know, we say these terrible things to each other, we know it hurts us to say these things, we keep on doing it. 
we push ourselves, we deny ourselves happiness and freedom and peace. Why? We have the pain of losing a loved one. Why is it we sort of keep that grief here? It's very clear to me as a Buddhist, as a meditator, to know that so many people are afraid of happiness. They just don't want to be happy. They don't want to be free of the problem. They don't want to be free of the addiction. You know why? It's because they don't love themselves. They don't really care enough about themselves. Something they did in the past, some guilt, some mistake, they keep right there in their hearts. I don't deserve to be happy for what I've done. Basically is the cause of those addictions. Most addictions, most harmful and hurtful behavior start from this deep-seated guilt inside of themselves. The idea that I need to be punished. That I don't deserve happiness. I don't deserve to be free. Which is why loving kindness becomes the next method of overcoming addictions. To start with that, we have to not feel guilty, not feel upset, not to have this terrible feeling of having to punish oneself because of the addictions. I'm an alcoholic, therefore I'm bad, therefore I don't feel good about myself, therefore I have to take more alcohol. I don't feel happy myself because of something I've done. I feel upset, therefore I have to make other people unhappy with through anger and ill will, which makes me feel even more unhappy. We keep these cycles of unhappiness. I am unhappy, therefore I feel guilty, therefore I want to punish myself, therefore I want to be more unhappy. These cycles of self-hurt. They keep on saying in the Western world that lack of self-esteem, the lack of it, like inner happiness, is one of the biggest mental problems of human beings. I don't have a lack of self-esteem. I'm quite at peace with myself. I don't think of myself as a great person, as a medium person, as a small person. This is what in Buddhism we call conceit. There's three conceits in Buddhism. I am better than other people. I am the same as other people. And I am worse than other people. It's interesting that third part is also a conceit. I am worse than others. In Buddhism we don't even measure ourselves against others. We've stopped that measuring, comparing ourselves to others. So being better or being worse or being the same just doesn't even come up. This actually frees ourselves from judging ourselves against others, which again is the root of guilt. Other people are okay, but not me. So when actually we overcome this sense of guilt, we overcome it with a sense of like loving kindness, which is a great way of overcoming addictions. You find if you're giving a bit of kindness, you're giving a bit of love, and you give that bit of kindness and love to yourself, you find that addictions and obsessions are very easy to overcome. Which is why the meaning of love, as you've all heard me say many times, is to say to yourself, the door of my heart is open to me no matter what I'm doing, no matter who I am. Even if I'm a drug addict, even I'm an alcoholic, even though I'm sort of do all these terrible things, still the door of my heart is open to me. I can be at peace with myself. I can love myself even though I'm doing these things. When you do this, you're actually undermining the cause of self-hurt self -hurt and self-harm. You're starting the rehabilitation process. You're rehabilitating yourself. Allowing yourself to be, accepting yourself for who you are, being at peace with yourself. This type of Buddhist love we call metta, loving kindness, is just so important that we keep repeating it again and again in so many different disguises. Loving kindness, the door of my heart is always open to you. It's called also letting go. 
You're letting things be as they are rather than trying to change them. It's called contentment. In particular it's called love. You're making peace with yourself. When you make peace with yourself, with all of your faults, if you try and make yourself perfect before you love yourself, I'm going to give up my addictions, give up all my own old bad habits, give up all the bad speech, give up all the terrible things, then I can love myself. You'll find you'll never make it. If you try and be perfect before you're at peace, you will die before you're at peace. What we have, the way of peace, is learning how to be at peace in the middle of imperfection. To be able to love someone even though they're not perfect. To be able to love someone even though they're far from perfect. To even to love someone even they may be even bad. Because that love is what heals the badness and stops it. There's many, many stories in the world when someone has received some kindness, some affection, some love, some acceptance and all their destructive behavior towards themselves and others stops. Stops right there. There are many stories of people who have done some terrible crimes and someone has come along and accepted them as a human being for who they are and they've taken that person as a brother, as a father, as a mother and would never do anything to harm anyone ever again. It's the power of kindness and love and that power of kindness and love is actually how we overcome those addictions. Instead of hating ourselves for our addictions, for our obsessions, for our bad behavior, we get to this amazing leap of courage the sleep of faith, doing things in a completely different way, finding a door where there shouldn't be a door and saying, in spite of all my alcoholism, in spite of all my addictions, in spite of all of this, the door of my heart is open to me. When you become at peace with yourself, when that love goes to yourself, when that forgiveness goes to yourself, when there's no reason to harm and punish yourself anymore, you find it so easy to give up those addictions. The reason for self-harm is taken away. The reason for punishment has been overcome. The path to freedom is open to you. Addictions and obsessions, hurtful behavior is like being in a prison. You know you can open that door at any time. No one else puts you in a prison, only yourself. No one else punishes you, only yourself. Because you know that you are the owner of your karma, as they say in Buddhism. You're punishing yourself, you're imprisoning yourself, no one else. It means you can also free yourself. Let yourself go. Let it be. Be at peace. To love the tiger, even though the tiger can be very wild. You can tame the tiger through kindness. That tiger inside of you, the heart, the hurt, the critical mind, the fault-finding mind, you can tame that. When it's tamed through loving-kindness, the door of my heart's open, you find that those addictions are so easy to to let go of. Because the root cause of them, the self-hurt, and what to hurt other people, is gone. You can give up. You can give up the alcohol. Give up the, the drugs. Give up the hurtful behavior. It's easy to do. People are only angry at others because they don't love themselves. They're not at peace with themselves. I've seen this so often in the great monks and nuns I've known. They just can't get angry at other people, no matter what other people do or say about them. Why? It's because they're at peace with themselves. If you love yourself, if you're at peace with yourself, you accept yourself, you find you can be so accepting of other people, so at peace, and destructive behavior disappears. So those of you who have addictions and obsessions, check that one out, whether you're not running on ill will or negativity. When that's overcome, you give yourself love and kindness, saying to yourself, again and again and again until you understand what the meaning of those words are the door of my heart's open to me no matter who I am no matter what I've done 
my love still goes unconditionally to myself then you know if you can know how to love yourself you know how to love others and your hurtful and harmful behavior stops right there and the wonderful thing is that when you start one stopping one hurtful obsessive behavior you find you start to feel this immense power and freedom I remember the time when I gave up alcohol as a student after giving up that alcohol I felt this surge of energy for about a whole week I was getting in charge of my life I realized I could do these things if I saw something was not really helpful for me I could actually let it go and stop it you have this immense feeling of power over your life, over your destiny especially your power over your happiness when you start to give up obsessive behavior give up some of the addictions you find it can be done you start one little thing you give up one addiction one obsession, one sort of negative means of behavior and then you know how to give up all the negative behavior and you feel surges of power and those are powers of freedom if you look upon these negative behavior this is again like these controllers inside of your mind these tyrants which make you do things which hurt you which make you do things which hurt other people and why do you need to take drugs? why do you need to sort of take alcohol? why do you need to, it costs a lot of money alcohol very expensive it would be much better to take a cup of tea and, and give the difference into the donation box <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not good for the economy but it's good for the Buddhist society's economy <laughs> so why do we do these things and we realize we don't have to do these things when we don't do these things life is so much freer when you don't have to have alcohol you don't have to have drugs when you don't have to watch these stupid soap operas and sometimes you know people don't come on a Friday night because there's an important soap opera on a Friday night or Tuesday evening in Armadillo they can't come because All Saints is on <laughs> you get all these addictions which people have to all these things they stop them really enjoying themselves and they're not free anymore they can't go anywhere because they have to be in for this and they have to be for that and they have to be for something else and this is crazy the addictions people have you're not, not free so when you overcome addictions one by one you feel this, this great surge of freedom and power yeah you can watch it if you want to but you don't have to you can watch the the, uh, the footy if you want to but you don't have to if something else is more important you can stop you can criticize someone else if you want to but you don't have to you're not a creature of habit anymore you're not predictable and you've got no buttons which are, you push this one and you've got the response and that makes you an amazingly free person people can call you a pig instead of getting angry just go oink oink <laughs> make a joke about it <laughs> you do all sorts of silly things and makes it like people can't make you angry and you won't get angry you won't allow anger in your house you're free of it you don't have to take alcohol you can go into the pub and just have an orange juice with your friends you're much more in control you can live your life free from those things you know which hurt because mindfulness gives you more opportunities love, loving kindness frees you of guilt simmy the snake you realize what the problem is you make it sure it's in your mind so you can overcome it and free yourself from it three very simple methods oh, and also said removing yourself from the problem from the trigger simple methods to overcome addictions and eventually you overcome all those addictions in your mind not just the gross ones of like drugs and alcohol and some really self-destructive behavior but also the other ones of like fault finding and ill will isn't it strange that these people we love we always tend to whenever we speak to them it's always pointing out faults isn't that what happens to you when people talk to you how often is it a fault finding you didn't do this you didn't do that 
how often is it praised? Oh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for being such a wonderful wife. Thank you for being such a great husband. Those of you who are married, the last week, how many times has your husband actually praised you and said, what a wonderful wife you are? How many times has your wife said, no, I really appreciate you as a husband? <laughs> and how many times have they been fault finding and critical? You understand what I mean? Those are negative behaviours which don't create any love and happiness in the world. So please change those addictions and obsessive behaviours and you feel more freedom and happiness. And change that towards yourself. So you praise yourself. You have gratitude to all the effort you've put into your lives. All the goodness which you've done. That makes you free. It makes you happy. It gives you energy. Energy to do good in the world. Addictions and obsessions are like put you in prison, harming yourself, and you're inna- unable to really give service to the world. Free yourself from those addictions and sufferings, and then you can do what life is really all about serving the community, increasing the gross national happiness of our community. I read that about the King of Bhutan. He's got this program because it's a poor country. They don't want it. They, it was the last country in the world which had televisions, Bhutan. Only in 2000 they decided to have a television service in the country. The uh, Princess of Bhutan, I've, she's a Buddhist and I've seen her a few times. She was telling me this. That, uh, and the king, her sister, uh, her brother, has got this new program now. Instead of the gross national product, which is what Western countries import, yeah, find is important, the Buddhist king of Bhutan has got this program, the gross national happiness. And he wants to increase the gross national happiness of his, of his country. This is the main thing of his country. That's why the government is working. That's what they're working for. The happiness economy of the people. A really good on him. It's a wonderful thing to do. A wonderful way of. It's only a small country, insignificant in the world, so he can get away with it without having the IMF on his back. But this is actually what life is all about: in increasing the gross national happiness in your family, increasing the gross national happiness of yourself and your friends, of our community, of our land, of our planet. That's why we give up obsessions and addictions. So we can really do what life is all about. The purpose and meaning of life. To increase the GNH. The gross national happiness of our world. So those are little ways of overcoming obsessions and addictions in your life. And the reason why we do these things. And also pointing out what life is all about. So there you are. It's really easy to do. No problem at all. So just do it. Okay. So on that note, just do it. I mentioned this talk this evening is sponsored once again by Nike. Just do it. Just do it. It's also that when you're free, it's just so wonderful. It's also sponsored by Toyota. Oh, what a feeling. <laughs> what else have we got? There's only two I know, I think. <laughs> So this is, uh, okay, you can go sideways now. Yeah, okay. Okay, go on, that ends the talk.